Thank you so much, Sam, and welcome to our fantastic guest, author Catherine Stewart, uh, who is her, to speak about her new book, The Power Worshippers, which is a fantastic read. And Catherine previously wrote a, another fantastic book called The Good News Club. She's also been a author uh, in, featured in The New York Times, The New Republic, The Washington Post, and also on NBC. Um, Catherine, Catherine's new book is about the rise of Christian nationalism, very timely subject. And we're really pleased that she could come speak with us about this. So I'd like to start by having Catherine sort of present a little bit about her book, and then we'll do a little uh, a bit of back and forth and talk about some of the, um, the questions that we have about the book. And finally, we'd like to open it up to the audience to hear some of your questions about this work. So with that, Catherine, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Allison um, and Samantha. I'm so happy to be here. And thanks to everyone at American Atheist for giving me the opportunity to speak and for the thoughtful, passionate, and very difficult work that you do in defense of religious freedom and the constitutional principle of church-state separation. First, I wanna acknowledge all of you listeners for being here. Thank you so much for making the time to connect. Um, these are really turbulent days. And the fact that so many of you have tuned in for this talk is really encouraging. We all care deeply about our country and its future. And that's why I'm here today to talk about the threat of uh, religious nationalism in America. I wanna tell you about some of the most intriguing and unexpected features of today's Christian nationalist movement. I'm hoping for plenty of time to hear from you guys. But first I wanna talk about why this movement reserves a special contempt for the non-religious. The consensus is still in some quarters to view the religious right through a culture war friends, focused on issues like abortion and LGBT equality. But what we're really looking at is Christian nationalism, a political movement that ties the idea of America to certain approved religious and cultural identities, and basically says that the America was founded on the Bible. Religious, religious nationalism is also an ideology, and it's fundamentally incompatible with modern constitutional democracy. It rejects equality and the idea of a just and pluralist society that our constitution is meant to uphold. Religious nationalism divides the us from the them, the supposedly pure from the supposedly impure. And it focuses the grievances of its base on demonic or a dehumanized other. So who are these demonic others for the movement? The number one threat as they see it is secularism. I mean, there are other targets to progressive Christians and other progressive religious folks receive their fair share of contempt. Movement leaders are always decrying the false theology, as they call it, of progressive people of faith. America's religious minority groups, such as Muslims, are another easy target, and they're constantly warning us against what they call radical feminists and the LGBT totalitarians, as they put it. But when they're looking for a single target to blame, an internal enemy upon whom to focus their rage and hate, it's most often secularists, the atheists, the agnostics, the nuns, the humanists, the skeptics, the free thinkers, the doubters, the searchers and the seekers, even just people who'd rather spend their Sundays fishing, but who are somehow meant to be out there ransacking everything good and holy in our society. And they conflate liberal and progressive politics with the absence of a belief in their God. As the well-connected evangelist and commentator Franklin Graham has said, Progressive, that's just another word for godless. Innumerable officials in the Trump administration are on board with this program. Trump's attorney general, William Barr, delivered an infamous speech at Notre Dame in which he blamed secularists, as he called it, for moral chaos and, uh, I'm quoting here, immense suffering, wreckage, and misery. Mr. Barr's views contribute to how he has directed his Justice Department on matters concerning the First Amendment Clause forbidding the establishment of a state religion. Mr. Barr told law students at Notre Dame, we keep an eye out for cases or events around the country where states are misapplying the Establishment Clause in a way that discriminates against people of faith. Barr, like other members of Trump's cabinet, has embraced wholesale the religious liberty rhetoric of today's Christian nationalist movement. It's really a distortion of religious liberty. When religious nationalists invoke religious freedom, it's typically code 
for religious privilege. The freedom that they have in mind is the freedom of people of certain conservative and authoritarian varieties of religion to discriminate against those over whom they wish to exert power. This form of religious liberty seeks to foment a sense of persecution and paranoia. And that's actually a, a main, main way of how they build their base. It always singles out groups that can be blamed for society's ills, scapegoats that can be subject to state-sanctioned discrimination and belittlement. The purpose of this type of religious liberty rhetoric is not just to secure a place of privilege for their groups alone, but also to justify public funding for religion. More than anything, the more I watch this movement, I see it's a lot of it's about access to public money. So, um, you know, at Christian nationalist meetings and strategy gatherings that I've attended over the past decade, the Democratic Party and its supporters are often described as demonic and associated with the rulers of the darkness, as they call it, with the devil. Now, if you know, like they know, they feel sure that society is under a dire existential threat from the secularists, and they truly believe that all these folks have found a home in the other party. And I think that uh, with this framework, every conceivable compromise with principles, every ethical breach, every backroom deal is justifiable to them. Um, I mean, not just justifiable, but also an imperative. And this brings us back to the issue of authoritarianism. People keep asking how the religious right can continue to stand behind a leader like Trump with his long history of doing and saying things that no so-called values voter or anyone who cares about family values should want to endorse. In fact, Trump's clear disdain for the rules is part of his appeal. His transparently immoral character makes him the ideal leader of a religious nationalist state. Trump represents the lawlessness of the authoritarian. He puts himself above the law and is therefore representative of the authoritarian impulses of his supporters. Authoritarians today around the world target what they call infidels or heretics for contempt and persecution. This is not unique to America, not remote, remotely unique as you all know, and it's also not unique to our time. It's happened throughout history. Think about America's pro-slavery theologians who promoted the idea of our country as an authentically and orthodox Christian nation with hierarchies rooted in the Bible. They too cast abolitionists as heretics and atheists. I wanna read a quote from you, this uh, pro-slavery the theologian that I was uh, researching and wrote about in my book. This is how he put it. He said, the parties in this conflict, meaning the conflict over um, abolition versus the slaveholders and defenders of slavery. He says, the parties in this conflict are not merely abolitionists and slaveholders. They are atheists, socialists, communists, red Republicans on the one side and friends of order and regulated freedom on the other. So he's actually putting the abolitionists on the side of the atheists and slaveholders on the side of regulated freedom and Christian orthodoxy in his view, his interpretation of it. A century later, segregationists who called those who opposed institutionalized racism, racism atheistic um, uh, were you know, sort of singing the same tune. Bob Jones Jr. was one of them. He delivered a radio address in 1960 titled, Is Segregation Scriptural? In which he declared, um, it's kind of amazing. He said, um, God is the author of segregation. And he, actually called the practice God's established order. We've got it right here. And he actually called desegregationists satanic propagandists and religious infidels who are trying to overthrow the established order of God. So he too was um, using his conservative interpretation, hierarchical authoritarian version of the religion to actually justify discrimination. In the 1980s, the influential theologian and radio personality, D. James Kennedy. Oh my gosh. He also, by the way, received at least $5.5 million in donations from the family of Betsy DeVos, who is, as you know, the education secretary. Um, he um, uh, was very hostile to the whole principle of public education. And in this pamphlet, which he published in 1986, he wrote, 
um, my friends, the anti-Christian, anti-God bias, the censorship of all things Christian, the infusion of an atheistic, amoral, evolutionary, socialistic um, system of education in our public schools has indeed become such that if it had, had been done by an enemy, it would be considered an act of war. This is the dude that Betsy DeVos's uh, family uh, supported with their tax dollars. So that gets at something else. The religious right is aiming squarely at public schools. They have this enormous contempt for public education and it's rooted in hostility to pluralism, equality, critical thinking, respect for science and the values of the enlightenment. Um, they think that public schools fail to affirm their religion and they think anything that fails to affirm their viewpoint is somehow hostile to it. But you see those values ironically um, respect for critical thinking, sort of respect for pluralism and the ideal of equality, you know, are baked into our founding principles. They have been applied imperfectly over time in obvious ways to be very sure. But the extent to which we can pursue these ideals, we spread justice and achieve great things. And whenever we try the opposite, religious authoritarianism, we spread injustice and pain. The Christian nationalist movement is a machine with many components, including religious right policy groups, networking groups, media uh, initiatives, legislative initiatives, legal and data organizations, and the like. I don't have time to describe all of them, unfortunately, so I'm just gonna talk about a few. Let's talk about how the machine, machinery is working through churches. Leaders of the movement have figured out that pastors drive votes, and so they organize pastors into networks that get them all on the same page politically. I wanna give you an idea of what this looks like on the ground. So I was recently attending a pastor's networking event at a church in uh, rural North Carolina, along with dozens of evangelical pastors from the area. The event was aimed at teaching them how to communicate to their congregations the key issues that supposedly matter in elections and the bibli biblically correct way to vote on them. The event was organized by Watchmen on the Wall. It's a project of the Family Research Council. Um, American Atheists is very familiar with them. They're one of the most powerful policy groups of the Christian right. Watchmen on the Wall claims to have over 27,000 pastor members and has been openly endorsed by Republican political leaders, including Vice President Mike Pence. So from the moment I walked into this church, I could tell that this was clearly not a politically neutral affair. Family Research Council President Tony Perkins, who spoke at the event said, actually I have it in my book. He said, I believe that this last election 2016 was a result of prayer. And um, he said, we've seen our nation begin back to, uh, to move back to a nation that respects the sanctity of life. So what he's signaling here is that the single issue that matters most, the issues that pastors should care about and communicate to their congregants is abortion. They know if you can get people to vote on a single issue, a single you know, binary life or death issue, you can get their vote. So then the pastors were instructed to form culture impact teams. The idea is for pastors to create within their churches teams of congregants that will, as they describe it, advance kingdom values, you know, kingdom values in the public arena. So pastors are instructed to figure out which members of the congregations are politically active, and connected to other congregants and motivated to get them out to vote their so-called biblical values. And they gave them really sophisticated tools to do it, including um, they promised a film, there were tons of voter guides, and then there was this thing here, it's called a culture impact team manual. It's, it's not a simple document, it's actually maybe 200 pages or 175 of instructions. It's very detailed, so they're not just telling people to get out and motivate other congregants to vote. They have these types of resources and messaging materials to help them do it. You know, a fundamental motivation behind those tools like culture impact teams uh, manuals is to get around IRS guidelines that say pastors can't endorse candidates from the pulpit, but nothing stops the congregants from doing their own church-based political activism if it's all supposedly about the culture. So several, several years ago, I interviewed a pastor about this type of initiative, he called it a God-given loophole. He said, it threads a separation of church and state loophole. So now let me tell you something about the political messaging of the movement leaders. When they're talking to congregants, 
or when they're talking to the pastors about talking to the congregants at these pastors events. It's all abortion all the time. In fact, I heard one leader tell a group of Latino pastors who has gathered at a, an event for them, if uh, someone asks you about the minimum wage, you got to ask them what's more important, a few extra dollars or life. And you know, when they put it that way, a few extra dollars or life, you know, the minimum wage or life, you know, the answer is supposed to make itself clear. So it's all abortion all the time, the beginning and the end for them. But when you look at the political messages in more detail, and especially the messages that they're sending to one another and to elites in power, it's not just about abortion. A lot of it is about money, how the Bible favors low taxes or no taxes for the rich, how the Bible favors minimal government or no government regulation of business, about how the Bible is against environmental regulation and against the social safety net, unless the social safety net is managed by the church, which is receiving, often receiving public money for the purpose. So a lot of it does come down to money. And I learned a lot about that when I visited a large agricultural fair in California's San Joaquin Valley. I was there to attend the 20th anniversary celebration of Ralph Drollinger. He's the founder of Capital Ministries, ooh, and the author of this book. I get to show all the books that I have fun reading in my spare time. Uh, and he um, targets political leaders at the top levels of government. He has this weekly Bible study group in the Capitol that's been attended by at least 12 out of 15 uh, cur um, current and former members of Trump's cabinet. And he also has Bible study groups targeting the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, so he's really arguably one of the most politically influential pastors in America. At the event I attended, Agricultural Secretary Sonny Perdue was on hand to deliver a big speech, and so is Michelle Bachman. And there were many other politicians there, uh, many other names you'd, rec um, you'd recognize or uh, might recognize delivering speeches and endorsement. So the expansiveness on Drollinger's positions on domestic, economic, and foreign policy really hits home the fact that this is a political movement, you know, broad political movement with a broad vision, not merely a stance in the so-called culture war. He weighs in on a number of social and economic policy questions, including the idea that social welfare programs have no basis in scripture. He uh, favors tax policies that benefit the rich, and he has referred to environmentalism as a false religion. He um, has all these wonderful um, Bible study uh, uh, texts that he publishes, but you can also see a lot of his stuff online. He's not hiding it. He's got this Bible study called Toward a Better Biblical Understanding of Lawmaking. You could go look it up. He cites from the New Testament, um, servants be submissive to your masters with all respect. This is what he says in his thing. He says, servants be submissive to your masters, not only those who are good and gentle, but also those who are unreasonable. So he's citing the New Testament here. Um, and here he explains the economy of Rome at the time of Peter's writing was one of slave and master. The principle, however, of submitting to one's boss carries over to today. I mean, think about that, you know, comparing one's relationship now to a relationship between a slave and master, it's kind of, you know, it makes me scratch my head. This is all music to the ears, of course, of the movement's ultra-rich funders, many of whom rely on minimal workers' rights and economic and environmental deregulation to maintain and increase their profits. So some of these positions are parroted by other movement leaders today, including David Barton. Do you and know who he is? Um, if you don't, you should learn about him. He's a historical revisionist. I call him the Where's Waldo of the movement because he sits on the board of so many of its initiatives. So Barton too has argued that the Bible and God oppose progressive income taxes, opposes capital gains taxes, because he obviously knows, and opposes minimum wage laws. This is how he interprets the Bible. And he exploits and distorts the issue of slavery to make his point. He's got this, um, paper that was on last I checked um, from his website, The Wall Builders, it's called The Bible, Slavery and America's Founders. This is on his website and he wrote, different forms of slavery have replaced the more obvious form of system of past centuries. And then he writes, the state has assumed, assumed the role of master for many, providing aid and assistance and with it more and more control to those unable to provide themselves then Barton writes, the only solution to slavery is the liberty 
of the gospel. That's what David Barton has to say about um, slavery and liberty of the gospel. I mean, if this sounds offensive to you, it's because it is. First of all, Barton is attempting to deracialize and literally whitewash, as it were, the explicitly racist institution of slavery in America, which is an incredibly offensive thing to do. He's actually trying to cast the social safety net things like job training and healthcare and food assistance as a form of slavery. It's just wrong on so many levels. You know, but while leaders of this movement oppose what they call government handouts to the poor, they seem to have no trouble at all with government handouts and other free goodies to conservative religious organizations. The movement has learned to siphon public money through subsidies, tax deductions, grants. They don't receive like massive tax deductions and you know, um, special subsidies that other non-religious nonprofits don't get, like parsonage exemptions. But, um, you know, they, they get vouchers and other schemes. The role of public money, I guess what I'm saying, is huge. Movement leaders are not only eager to safeguard what they've got, they're after vast potential flow of public money in the future. This past winter, eight federal agencies proposed changes in how they will work with religious organizations uh, you know, under Trump. This is what happens. They want to substantially increase the flow of public money to their groups in ways that allow them to continue to discriminate in hiring and the application of services. And also, if the aid is delivered in certain types of indirect form, like through grants or vouchers, it also means they can proselytize while they're doing it, all in the name of so-called religious liberty. <clears throat> So now I wanna shift a little bit from discussing some of the get out the vote initiatives to discussing one of the legislative initiatives that um, American Atheist has been really involved with. Are you guys familiar with the organizations, the American Legislative Exchange Council or what's called ALEC or with Americans United for Life? It's an anti-abortion organization. These organizations craft model pieces of legislation so it, like, it allows legislators to easily introduce bills in different states without needing to research and write the bills themselves. It kind of gets everyone with the same political vision on the same page. It provides a kind of unity you know, across, across the lines. So Project Blitz works along similar lines. The idea is to overwhelm state legislatures with so many religiously oriented bills that some of them can be expected to get through and the center of the debate gets shifted to the right. Ultimate aim here is to secure a license for certain faith groups to discriminate against other faith groups and conflate in the minds of the public their religion with the authority of government. It's a way of signaling to everybody through the law that there is a group in American society that is privileged and other groups that are not deserving of privilege. Sometimes when these bills come through the states, we look at them in a kind of individual or siloized fashion. We think, oh, what's the harm of allowing outside groups to put in God we trust signs in our kids' public schools and maybe in their classrooms and maybe on police cars. You know, in fact, these are all pieces of a larger puzzle. Um, the in God we trust signs are really just the first level of this. The third level, the ultimate aim of these um, bills is to secure a license to discriminate. Um, but Project Blitz shows us that the Christian right understands these bills not only relate to one another, but they also further a broader Christian nationalist political vision. So, you know, we should all be alarmed by the rise of uh, the religious right as a political force and what it means for our country's future. But we should be feeling despair. We in America have faced terrible crises and challenges before and often the greatest periods of progress emerge from them. I think we're seeing a lot more political engagement today than we saw five or six years ago, but you simply can't affect meaningful change without winning elections, and there is no substitute for the power of the vote. The religious right understands that. Sometimes I think that others don't understand that quite as well. We can't allow ourselves to be comforted by the polls a mistake people make is that they assume the majority rules in a country like the United States. It does not. In a country where 40% or 50% of people don't turn out to vote and an additional tragic number are disenfranchised through race-based voter uh, gerrymandering and voter suppression and other dirty tricks like the ones that we, we've been seeing lately, um, you don't need 
uh, a majority to win elections. You just need a committed minority to access the levers of power. The challenges we face today are political, and so the solutions are political too. The right has invested in all the tools of modern campaign infrastructure, data, media, and messaging. These tools are available to all of those who oppose the politics of conquest and division that the movement represents. Religious nationalists are using the tools of democratic political culture to, to dis dismantle democracy, but those same resources can be used to restore it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Catherine. That was fantastic. I appreciate it. So this is, you know, it's a really interesting time to be speaking about Christian nationalism, given everything that's happening. And, um, you know, just this past week, I guess last week, we were treated to a really interesting display of the president sort of using tear gas and clearing away peaceful protesters in order to go across the street to a church and hold up a Bible to sort of display his, I don't know what, his, I guess, fealty to his, you know, the people that, these Christian people, that nationalists that support him. Um, some members of the church's clergy were actually cleared away in the process. So it, it's interesting that this is such a display, such a visual display of um, quote unquote religious freedom, but it has nothing to do with actual religious freedom. It's just mm -hmm. about public appearance. And so, Given that, I'm curious, does it, what does this episode, things like this, mean for the future of America? Should we be expecting more of this type of pure religious spectacle in our politics? And, um, you know, does this actually appeal to anyone? Does this appeal to the president's Christian nationalist audience? Oh, my gosh. I mean, thanks for asking that question, Allison. It's a, it was kind of an astonishing moment. That moment, uh, that Bible photo op was really important because it made two basic statements. The first is the more obvious one, but it's actually the second one that matters more. So I wanna go through both of them. The first one is that um, the Bible stunt was meant to communicate that we're engaged in a struggle between the righteous and the damned, the believers and the non-believers. So Trump's holding up the Bible was a declaration um, that we are a Christian nation. Remember, he didn't hold up the Declaration of the Independence or the Constitution. It was us versus them. And the second part of that act was actually more important it has to do with the violent clearing of the peaceful protesters. Yeah. You know, uh, when uh, Bill Barr at Trump's behest calls in the military and asks them to clear with uh, tear gas and rubber bullets, that was very much part of the act. And it was a statement that the Bible is above the law, that the Christian nation comes before the Constitution. You see, the Christian nationalism is really an authoritarian system of government. And within the system, the leader who speaks for the nation is himself above the law. So those are the two message, messages that that moment conveyed. It was kind of like, you know, he was holding up the Bible as almost like a, a, a weapon, you know, and aiming it squarely at the constitution. So, um, and he was basically showing, and did his, his supporters love it? Yes, they did. You know, Franklin Graham said something nice about it. Tony Perkins said something. Robert Jeffers said something nice about it. Um, and uh, and uh, they called him heroic and other types of w nice words and his a lot of his supporters uh, felt um you know can't speak for all of them but a lot of them enjoyed it um will it happen again i think trump would love to have it happen again he's demonstrated beyond question that if he could throw away the constitution forget about democracy and have the military stamp out his enemies and enact his will he would love that and i think he will count on you know, the core of his Christian national supporters to back him up. Whether it happens again or not really depends on whether we allow it to happen again, whether we continue, you know, with this type of political regime with the leaders who have these same um, ideas. Well, you know, I hope it, I hope it leads to a backlash because I have to say that I, I feel like there's been a bit of a turning point after that situation. It was recognized by a large part of the political spectrum, maybe not the Christian nationalist part, but the rest of the, the political spectrum as being over the top and just sort of outrageous. And I feel like there's been sort of a, a turning away, uh, at least a little bit. His um, numbers have since um, decreased significantly since that period. But I wanted to ask you about the response from the Democrats, particularly Majority Leader Pelosi who responded by doing her own sort of, I guess I call it a Bible reading as well, to show an alternative view from the president. 
she didn't push back on Christian nationalism or the uh, uses of religion in politics. She doubled down on it and basically, you know, tried to present an alternate view using religion to justify her stance. And I, I guess I'm curious, why are lawmakers, and I'm sort of generalizing here, but why are lawmakers so afraid to confront Christian nationalism or so ill-prepared to do so that they have to, they feel they have to come at it from this other sort of religious angle. They can't push back on it by itself. I think it's, I think Christian nationalism is really poorly understood. And I think part of the problem is it's really difficult to talk about the political actions of religious groups without appearing to bash religion. Mm. But there is a difference. I mean, religion is so personal to so many people. For so many of them, it's intrinsic to their families and their heritage. And uh, nobody wants to be perceived as intolerant. Um, uh, but at the same time, we're not really looking at religion. We're looking at partisan agitation. So people have a hard time making that distinction. I think, um, you know, Pelosi, what she was doing, which is reminding Americans, of course, that there is more than a single uh, Christian tradition, more than one way to interpret the Bible. And she's, uh, in a way, reassuring Americans, re religious Americans, correctly, that if you're religious, you don't have to give up or compromise on your religion if you don't happen to support a corrupt president like Trump or other sort of hyper conservative politicians that the movement favors. But you know, here's the thing, you're not gonna be able to solve political problems with theology. You can't um, make a certain kind of political religion turn into a liberal religion simply by arguing this or that theological interpretation or this or that reading of a holy text. Um, that's, you know, the issue is basically a political, this is a political movement and it's a political problem. And that's what America's founders understood. You know, when you engage in a political conversation in a republic, you appeal to facts and evidence and reason and sort of um, ideas that can be commonly shared. You don't invoke revealed truths in a democracy. You know, the separation of church and state comes down to the fact that you know, these types of religious arguments are really interesting and I think can be really fruitful, but they belong in, um, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in private homes and public parks and churches and houses of worship or any of the, you know, number of other places or in the pages of uh, newspapers or ever. But what, what if you're talking about a political problem and a political forum, you need to, um, you know, the only way to work with other people is to show them respect. And the only way to do that in a democratic and pluralistic context is to debate with them in terms of values that you share with them and not in terms of beliefs you're trying to impose on them. Fantastic. I, um, I get this question all the time when I'm doing presentations on Project, uh, Project Blitz, for example, which you mentioned. And I, um, I, I feel this, this, is, this really gelled for me when, in your book when you were talking about um, Christian nationalism as a political ideology, not a religious one. But can you just give a, like a brief definition? What is Christian nationalism? How would you describe it to someone who's never heard of it? Maybe someone from another country. Like how would you describe, what, what is Christian nationalism? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. First, it's not a religion, absolutely. It's a political ideology that ties the idea of America to specific uh, religious and um, cultural identities. Um, it uh, insists that the foundation of our country is um, the Bible, not the Constitution, and and always insists that you know we need to get back to sort of a, a great uh, uh, idea of a fa biblical foundation that has somehow been lost, and that if we lose that, we're going to lose everything that's good in our society. So religious nationalism is also a really effective way of mobilizing and often manipulating large portions of the American public. You know, it's a way of getting people to vote a certain way, a way of sort of controlling their behavior. Yeah. Um, can you put Christian nationalism in context with other types of religious nationalism we're seeing around the world? I think there's definitely been an increasing wave of religious nationalism. I think it's pretty indisputable. And many countries, um, for example, you know, away, away from democratic governance and towards more nationalist and sort of autocratic um, governance that's often based in religion. And so, what, what's that? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I just 
jumped in because it's so exciting to hear you bring that oh, up, yeah, the things with other forms of religious nationalism around the world. Um, I mean, I think we have to start by noting that religious nationalism practice almost never ends in a genuine theocracy and certainly won't end up in a Christian democracy. It's national, um, sorry, nat natural destination is a kind of kleptocracy mm -hmm. led by irrational, often nepotistic, autocratic leaders in which to organize hypocrisy takes the place of religion. So rather than uniting the population, um, such governments tend to deepen existing divides. The leaders of these groups often turn to conservative religious leaders to support, you know, for support in order to mask a, a popular mandate or to um, quell dissent. Um, when you think about leaders like Orban in Hungary or um, Putin in Russia or Erdogan in Turkey, when they bind themselves to religious nationalists, I'm sorry, religious conservatives in their countries in order to consolidate a more authoritarian form of political power, we rightly identify that as religious nationalism. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's what we're seeing with America today. And, and by the way, they often forge military alliances to enforce their aims. And I think that's one of the things that was so concerning to a lot of folks when, um, you know, with that uh, photo op uh, in uh, Lafayette Square. Is it possible for religious nationalism either here or in other countries to coexist with democracy or is it, um, are they mutually exclusive? Like, you know, we have a political party and perhaps elements of the other that are, you know, have a lot of elements of this. So is it possible? I mean, has it ever happened or, or not? Religious nationalism is an autocratic, it doesn't believe in equality, pluralism, or the values in, of the enlightenment. The, these are the values, uh, the ideals that our country is founded upon. Again, um, applied very imperfectly over time, but these are, are ideals worth fighting for. But religious nationalism um, imposes a kind of hierarchy of um, a virtue. It conflates the idea of a kind of, it, it conflates patriotism with a conservative interpretation of, of, uh, of religion, um, always invoking certain hierarchies that are, um, which they say are coming from God. So it is not a democratic system, certainly not in a pluralistic society, a society is irreducibly pluralistic as America, you know. Um, I want to change gears a little bit and ask about, I mean, you have such amazing stories in this book. I, I really enjoyed reading about the places you've been and people you've met with, and I can't help but wonder how you get into these places to hear about this, this you know, these societies that are frankly usually pretty close to outsiders. And um, I'm curious, what is it like for you to travel and interact with these Christian nationalist groups? Well, I go where places I'm allowed to go. Like anybody can buy a ticket to a Values Voters Conference. Anyone can go to a March for Life. Anyone can go to a church service or any of those places. So I go to those places where I'm allowed to go and, and then um, always use my real name. Uh, but a lot of my research was done here in my office listening to what they say on their radio shows, you know, listening to hundreds of hours of, of radio uh, or broadcast or finding out what they said when they did an interview with David Brody on sort of a religious TV network or um, Morning Star network and, you know, watching those sh uh, shows and reading a lot of what they write. I mean, um, I think that, um, you know, listening is underrated. I spend a lot of time listening to what leaders of the movement have to say um, and reading what they write. I think people often misunderstand the movement because they don't pay attention to what its leaders have to say in detail. You know, it's also true that some members of the movement or ex-members engage with me, and those are interesting connections, uh, really helpful connections. They help me uh, remember, you know, they, 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 they help me really understand that a lot of the movement leaders are sincere. They have really sincere intentions. Um, uh, you know, a lot of them want as much as anyone to build a secure and prosperous America. But uh, unfortunately, in my view, all of their, you know, efforts are being, you know, harnessed in service of this agenda that's dividing our nation with religious animus, uh, degrading our discourse and our laws, and, uh, you know, has put, an, I think, an incredibly uh, corrupt uh, leadership in office and, uh, and is undermining our constitutional principles. And harming our country. Yeah. Has there been, especially with those more personal contacts, and there's uh, quite a few examples of you like knowing 
you know, um, preachers, for example, and going to events that normally, you know, people, general public would not be available to get into or allowed to get into, especially some of the pastor sort of events you were talking about. Has there been any kind of backlash because of this book? I'm curious, like, have you lost any, uh, has, has there been any reaction from people that did allow you access? It's more a matter of curiosity than anything else. <laughs> Well, interestingly, uh, one of the, I mean, a, a couple of them have reached out since and continue to engage with me in a really friendly um, back channel way, which is nice. Um, some of them, you know, write terrible things about me, but are actually kind of um, civil, uh, which is very interesting. But I have gotten an awful lot of, I mean, there's been a lot of backlash, not so much to the books, but to the op-eds that I write. Um, most of my uh, pieces that I write articles um, are received with hit pieces from one right-wing outlet or another. Um, they used to ignore my work and they don't anymore, which I think is kind of a compliment of sorts. I mean, it was Andy Warhol who, who said something like, um, don't pay attention to what they write about you, just, just measure it in, in inches. So that's what I do. Um, so you know, if I write something and it doesn't get some kind of hit piece in response, I'm like, hmm. um, I'm sort of joking about that. But something very interesting happened actually when my last book was published. I was approached by someone who claimed to be a member of a team of people who had been hired to suppress my work online and elevate anything about me that they could find like an unflattering photograph or an article with a weird headline that could be used to discredit me. This uh, person who approached me was a kind of young, uh, very tech savvy graduate of uh, an evangelical college and they were questioning their sexuality at the time. Um, although they're the people who hired them to um, to do this work were no doubt unaware of that. Um, so we're not in touch now. And of course, it was just somebody who communicated with me for a while and we've lost touch. But that was really interesting to hear about. Um, yeah. Well, the good news is it hasn't worked. I mean, obviously, you're a, you're a well, it's interesting. Author. Yeah, I know that like, you know, hostile people sort of like wiki bombed me after one of my pieces came out. I wrote a piece uh, for the Times titled The Religious Rights Hostility to Science is Hampering Our Coronavirus Response. Mm -hmm. And um, boy, that I got like a lot of hit pieces for that. Um, and at that, and there were all kinds of, you know, incoming. The piece actually had a briefly had a different headline, which look, even heads of right wing policy groups know that writers at many publications don't write their own headlines, but you know, it was changed. And, but they attacked me for the headline long after it had, been, it had been changed. I thought it was really interesting that they had to attack me for something I didn't actually write um, rather than my actual words, because if they did that, then people might read them and then they might have been challenged by my arguments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so reading your analysis of David Barton, who you mentioned a little bit earlier, um, the revisionist quote unquote historian, <laughs> Um, behind much of the false historical narrative that sort of undergirds this entire movement. Um, I was curious the extent to which, you know, people like him knowingly are spreading falsehood for the sake of power versus how much, how many are true believers? Is it a mixture? I mean, some of the folks in the Christian nationalist movement are like, you know, they're they're lawyers. They they know like the background of the country. They, they, they work in legal matters all the time or they have like a real they should have a real solid understanding of how civics works and where the country, how the country is founded. And yet they're still claiming uh, some of the false narratives that we hear. And then there's people like David Barton. Um, so I'm just curious, to what extent do people, are people making this up versus people who actually believe this narrative? Yeah, you can't know what's in everybody's hearts, especially a diverse group of people, but I think it's safe to say that they believe in the general truth of what they're advancing. That is, they believe the US was founded as a Christian nation and will fail if it loses its Christian heritage. So I think, I think they're actually sincere in that general belief and committed enough to that belief. And here's the point, they're committed enough to that, that they're more than willing to overlook some details or, right. or to be particularly scrupulous about how they handle the facts because they know that whatever the facts will say, this is the important point to get across. So for instance, they're not really bothered by the fact that James Madison never said the United States Constitution is based on biblical law because at some level they believe that that's what he meant to say. So I think that they're really political and that it's much more important for them, they think, to convince the public of the general truth than to conduct neutral or scholarly investigations. 
Um, yeah, and I, I'm sure there's a quite a bit of degree of cognitive bias in there as well, right? If that's what they get power for believing, that's what they're going to continue to believe. Um, I know, yeah. I mean, I think I've read some of Barton's work where I think he's actually um, sophisticated enough and informed enough to see that there are counter arguments and, mm -hmm. and there is counter evidence to his position, but he invests, you know, invests a lot of time and energy in coming up with like convoluted and extremely complicated arguments that essentially dispose of any evidence that contradicts his basic commitments, like the commitments really guide his interpretation. Yeah. But you know, that's all kind of speculation. I, I think we can, you know, rule out the idea that they that they um, that they uh, you know just know that they're making it all up. I think they have certain commitments and then they they shape the facts to suit their commitments. Well, I'm less certain about the funders, like people like the the Cokes, for example, you know, or people like that that are, they're not necessarily believers in this, but because it, you know, advantage it's advantageous advantageous to them politically, they might fund these sorts of issues. Is that right? I mean, they might have a different ideology, but fund these things anyway. Yeah, the movement relies to. There's like a huge. It's kind of like the the proselytize, like the, the, I call it in one chapter, the proselytizers and the privatizers. I mean, I think there's a lot of this sort of extended, uh, you know, hyper wealthy funders, many of them belonging to extended hyper wealthy families. I write about so many of them in my book, like the Prince DeVos family, the Green family, um, uh, the Wilkes brothers and so many others. Um, they're, I think, as committed to right wing and, or libertarian economic policy as they are to, um, you know, conservative religion, um, and and so they like you know spend ex extraordinary amounts of money funding a lot of these initiatives, uh, and it really gets back to that sort of like thing that we talked about earlier about Ralph Drawlinger. I mean, um, how do you get a large numbers of people to vote in economic policies that are going to make it harder for families to succeed, not easier? That are going to intensify. Uh, economic inequality, which is something that is very well documented and that's actually reached a kind of uh, critical level. It's really quite dangerous to have. It's very destabilizing to have this level of economic inequality in our country. But how do you get like the base to go along with it? Most of them are actually kind of losers in the sort of upward flow of of, of money that uh, these the economic policies are advancing. Well, you get them to do it if you can get them to vote on abortion you know, LGBT equality and same-sex marriage and the like. And um, so we, exactly. I, think, I think the funders understand that. So there's this sort of marriage, very happy marriage between um, right-wing religion and sort of that sort of libertarian, far-right, you know, economic policy. You, you raise a really good point with the focus on abortion. And I, I loved reading about this in, in, in the book, like how they have shifted the conversation on abortion so much since um, Roe v. Wade, how it used to be uh, the mainstream position, even of Republic, of the entire, even of conservatives, very religious people, that abortion was fine, even acceptable. And now it's completely different. And so I, I don't know, I, I just, I thought that was fascinating and I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, I mean, the movement, um, let's just remember what was happening around the time that Roe v. Wade was passed. When it was passed, the Southern Baptist Convention hailed the decision. They called it a sensible middle ground between the extreme of, um, of you know, a total ban and an extreme of, of no regulation at all. Um, they actually approved of um, uh, abortion in order to preserve, I think it was like the health, the, the mental health, the physical health uh, of the mother, and also in case of, they had other, many other cases that they uh, named. Um, most Protestant Republicans at the time supported uh, some form of liberalization of abortion law. Ronald Reagan as governor of California signed into law the most um, liberal abortion law in 1967. Mm -hmm. uh, Barry Goldwater is a great conservative hero. He supported abortion law liberalization early in his career. His wife, Peggy, was a co-founder of Planned Parenthood in Arizona. Can you imagine a conservative politician today whose uh, spouse goes off and becomes a co-founder of a reproductive care clinic? That just wouldn't happen. So it happened over time is that there were a group of folks um, called, um, they called themselves the New Right, uh, involving Paul Weyrich and Jerry Falwell and uh, Phyllis Schlafly was involved, Howard Phillips. 
they were really unhappy with the direction of the Republican Party at the time. They thought it was too soft on communism. They were really alarmed that the IRS was starting to look askance at segregated academies. These like schools that were religious schools, often affiliated with these pastors, and they were actually practicing racial segregation. The IRS is saying, why are we giving you your tax breaks? And they were really offended by this. And they wanted to inspire a kind of hyper-conservative counter-revolution, but they knew that the issue of you know, defending the tech, tax status of segregated schools was gonna be uh, ugly and unpopular for them. So there's a, you know, they were also upset about school prayer and the women's rights movements and civil rights. And they sort of went down a list of issues. And when they got to abortion, it's like a light bulb went off. And they're like, huh, that could work. And so over time, what happened was um, pro-choice voices, um, of which there were quite a few, were purged from the Republican Party. And what you see today is a kind of almost like a new pro-life religion. It's almost so as though like the religious right has boiled all of politics down to religion and all of religion down to their question on abortion. Mm -hmm. And that's really a way that they get the vote. You know, that's how they get their vote. Yeah, it drives all the other issues. They just focus on that one issue, as you were saying. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, I think with David Barton, he, there's a quote, I don't have it in front of me. He said something to the effect of, if I know, if I want to know how, if a republic, if a politician is going to, you know, guard my money or, or treat my, you know, do the right thing with my money, I look at how he's going to vote on abortion. Because yeah. abortion is now so tied to, you know, right-wing economic policy in, in, in so many of these, uh, these uh, politicians. I, I have a, one more, I have a, a question about... Yeah. Thing. Given everything happening these days, it's obviously a topic there's a lot of conversation around. And yet, I, I believe that there's been sort of a, a rightward push to get more nationalists and Christian nationalists into police, local police stations, you know, sheriffs, like at, at every level. Um, and I'm curious if you have more information about that or if that's something you've researched and, you know, the impact that's having in this entire discussion. Well, thanks for, I mean, bringing that up. You probably know a lot about that too. I mean, there it's conflating the authority, authority of government with the authority uh, of their religion. And we know that uh, in some places, uh, thanks to um, Project Blitz, they've been able to place in God we trust uh, in God we trust stickers on police cars, which is kind of astonishing, isn't it? It is, and it's extremely hard to challenge. Um, and under the courts these days. So it's 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 really, we, we get a lot of complaints about that. And there's very, unfortunately, little we can do about it from a legislative, I mean, from a litigation angle. Yeah. So it's a legislative matter. Um, yeah, and They're really, I think to a completely underappreciated degree, the movement is getting its strategic direction from the legal advocacy groups that are sort of thinking about legislation, thinking about um, cases, bringing the right cases to the right courts. They're really clever about that. I mean. Um, they've really recast religion, uh, you know, as um, in, in many instances, as you know, Allison, as speech uh, from a certain point of, point of view and, and using this free speech clause to decimate the establishment clause. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And yeah. it's not that they're clever. It's that they have a hundred times the money of any secular group. I mean, if you have infinite resources, mm -hmm. then you can make mistakes. You can try different methods and you can bring in the top levels to talent. You know what I mean? There's there's a real significant impact that that has. Oh yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about money, look at the Federalist Society and how much money uh, sort of flows through the folks at the top there. I was just um, uh, reading a little bit about uh, the Federalist Society, which as you know, is a kind of um, like a grooming uh, organization for conservative justices. They groom and promote justices for um, uh, judicial appointments and things like that. And uh, Leonard Leo has been involved with, you know, dozens of nonprofit organizations. There are just three organizations. This is reported in the Washington Post. Just three organizations he was involved with that took in, I think, $33 million between um, 2016, 2017. And this is like, um, not the federal society itself, but if you look at some of the folks around the federal society and look at the amounts of money that sort of flow through that ecosystem, it's a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, we um, want to make sure we get to the audience questions, although this is a fascinating discussion and I have plenty of other questions, but let's make sure we turn now to hear from some from the audience. Hi, Sam. 
Hi, how are you today? Great. Um, excellent. We have a ton of questions, but before we get into them, I just want to answer a couple questions that were asked a few times. I did put them in the chat, so if you didn't find the chat button, it's over on your right-hand side. If you haven't been looking at the chat, there should be a little flashing emblem over there. And that has uh, Catherine's website and also the link to her book at Amazon. And then also um, we had a few people ask if we are recording this and how they can get a copy of it. And we are recording it. And tomorrow the link will go out with some information about how to find that recording. So you can watch it again. You can forward it to all your friends who missed it. You can make sure that you spread the word about this great programming. So we are recording it and we'll make sure that you get that link. Um, so like I said, we have a bunch of questions. I'm gonna do what I usually do, which is sort of take, they come in themes, right? Um, so there was a, a sort of theme when you were talking about Catholicism and Orthodox Catholics like Bill Barr and uh, versus the more liberal type Catholicism that's sort of espoused by Pope Francis. And then of course, real recently he made comments um, that were in the media about uh, abortion not being the only issue that, that conservative Catholics should be caring about. And so people were wondering if you could sort of comment on that and if you thought that that would have some impact on American voters or not. I'm not, I'm so sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Just, I mean, it's true that there are, you know, every religious tradition is very diverse um, and, uh, you know, different uh, religions view these questions, uh, different, uh, interpretations of the religion of different of religions that view these questions differently but i'm not entirely sure i understand the question that was asked i think what they were getting at more was with the election happening in 2020 and pope francis making these comments about you were talking about how abortion became the particular topic that mm -hmm. um, was focused on by christian nationalists and the catholic church and with him making these comments real pointedly honestly uh, about whether or not people should find that to be the only issue and they were kind of it was sandwiched in with his comments on racism and racism being a sin um so i think people were just wondering if you had a a take on that a hot take and he's well well he's also as you know sort of emphasized um the necessity of uh paying attention to environmental issues and he's gotten a lot of pushback uh for that from conservative uh, authorities. So I think within the Catholic Church, as within many other religious groups, there are there's this kind of um, tension between those who want to take certain, um, uh, uh, perhaps more progressive view on some of the issues and those who uh, don't want to do that and sort of want to dig, dig their heels in on some of the, you know, a culture war issues. Yeah. So you're saying we can't paint them all with the same brush? Is that what you're oh, saying? Oh, absolutely. No, <laughs> what one can't, one can't. And by the way, also, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people uh, characterize the movement as evangelical. But we have to remember that it includes a lot of evangelicals, but it excludes a lot of evangelicals too. And it also includes um, a large uh, number of um, representatives of both Protestant and non-Protestant religion. Um, you know, people say, you know, it's white evangelicals. Well, you know, four out of five white evangelicals supported Trump, one in five did not. Uh, I know a number of white progressive evangelicals who uh, uh, reject the politics of division and conquest that the movement represents. So um, yeah, one can, has, you know, never paint uh, any uh, group of people with the same brush. Absolutely. So the next sort of set of questions that people have is, is you guys touched on um, Project Blitz a couple times during the presentation in different ways. And there are a bunch of questions about um, trying to create a similar initiative on the secular side, fighting for the separation of religion and government. And how would we go about doing that? How would we be on the offensive instead of on the defensive on these issues? And that one, might be a question for both Allison and Catherine, in fact. Yes, and I have good news there. We are. Uh, you know, we, there are a lot of issues at the state level we support that are proactive. Most of those issues that American Atheist focuses on that are proactive are about ending the harm 
that religion does to especially vulnerable people such as young people like for example we support bills that would end or protect young people from conversion therapy that end child marriage that end uh, female genital mutilation you know things that are you know not not sort of inherent well, they're caused by religion and religious activities i mean people don't normally do conversion therapy unless there's a religious basis behind it um, and so those are some examples. We also have things that we're working on more proactively that focus on, um, that, that are basically driven by secular issues. Like for example, making sure that we have standing in the courts and working on bills to ensure that we have standing in the courts to challenge when there are establishment clause violations. That would be a great example. And those are being developed over time. And as we start to introduce and pass those bills, and yes, we will work to make sure we move them around from state to state. So right now we work in coalition with lots of other, other organizations on these matters. And over time, we hope to develop a more proactive slate of those types of, I don't know, I'll call them secular movement focused bills. Catherine, did you have anything to add those? It sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yes, do it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Um, and, and related to that, people are asking about running for office and why or how or when will it be possible to run as an open atheist or humanist and um, to be able to win those seats so that the, the people in office more accurately reflect the American public. Yeah, it's interesting. It's always about, you know, if you're, you know, the district and um, you know, if you're uh, an open atheist, it, um, you know, people should never have to hide their uh, religious background, you know. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, people should never have to hide their religious background. I think there are some open atheists who are running now. It's, you know, it's interesting. I think atheists and non-believers of, you know, all different varieties are over 20% of the population. It's like one of the largest groups in America. So um, it's really sad that it's become sort of acceptable to have this sort of, um, you know, contempt for this particular group. Uh, fortunately, I think attitudes have been changing over time. Um, in the re most recent polling on this, I think it was, I think it was 60% of people said that they would vote for an atheist for president. That's the highest it's been. So that still means four in 10 would not, but six in 10 would, which is the highest it's been. And it finally pulled ahead of another group, I believe, which was uh, Muslims. So there you go. Um, but still, it's it's on the low end. On the other hand, there are non-religious lawmakers in office all across the country. Um, you know, I think even in let's look at Arizona, for example, it has two state lawmakers who are amazing and who are explicitly atheist, right? So. Uh, or two or more. So, the, but the point is, this does happen, and it's a matter of exposure. I mean, the first person to basically be out and say, I'm an atheist and running for office might face an uphill battle, but that makes it so much easier for the next person, the next person after that. So I think it's a matter of being visible about one's identity and taking the risk and running for office in that visibility. And, you know, running for office is not about being an atheist, though. An atheist is something that you are while you're running for office. It should be about, some, it should be a, uh, a run that's appealing to the local folks in the district you want to represent. So it can't just be identity based, but I, I, I think it's important that as we move forward and encourage more folks to take an active role in politics, that they are uh, more forthcoming about their non-religious identities. Yeah, and I know that there's been a lot of work done across, again, multiple organizations to support people uh, who are running for office and give them some tools and, and uh, help them with that. So if you're on the call and you're interested in running for office, reach out, we'll put you in touch with some folks because the answer is run for office. I mean, a great <laughs> organization. Be more atheists in office. <laughs> Absolutely, and a great organization to look up there is the Center for Free Thought Equality. Uh, they are fantastic. Um, pack. Excellent. Let's see. We have um, some more questions. We have a couple that are sort of housekeeping. One wants to know how can they get a copy of a signed book. Oh um, wow. And is that is there a way to do that? Besides I wish was, attending our convention, which we had to postpone. So you know what I could do, actually, if anybody wants a signed copy, what I could do is if you send me their address, I will sign a plate 
and mail it to them and then they can put it in their book. I'd oh. be really happy to do that for anybody who wants it. Um, awesome. Because unfortunately in these uh, coronavirus times, I'm not traveling to bookstores or diff different places and I can't sign in person, but I'd be very happy if anybody wants to send me their address to like, I have some actually sticky things and you can, I'll sign them and, you know, and then Excellent. they can put them in their books. Excellent. So if anybody wants to do that, you'll get the follow-up email from me um, and then you can just yeah. email me back with your address and, and I'll make sure that, that we can do that. Yes. Um, there's another question that, um, sure and if they buy two, you... I'll write like a silly limerick on one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love writing silly limericks. <laughs> the next question I'm sure you're getting a lot right now, which is um, we have a 2020 election coming up. And if we assume that Trump is voted out of office and we have a new president, what do you see that needs to happen in order to roll back all of the things that have happened during his presidency and frankly before then um, to a place where we uh, once again have some good separation of religion and government? And the comment that they have is Seidel from FFRF says not to worry, we'll win because demographics are on our side. And in your book, you end more ominously. So what do we need to do in your opinion? Well, I think we need to remember that um, uh, demographics don't always drive um, the votes. So I'm gonna, first I'm gonna talk about the bad news, then I'm gonna talk about the good news, and then I'm gonna say this, what the solutions are. So the, first of all, the bad news is that, um, well, I'll just give you an example. So I was at a conference and I heard Ralph Reed, you know who he is, he's the head of, the, um, um, of one of the big right-wing policy groups, um, very politically active, real operator. He said, pay no attention to the polls. The demographics are not working in our favor. We are losing numbers. All that matters is who turns out on election day. And again, you know, we assume, we make the mistake of assuming that in our country, a majority wins. It's not true when um, a lot of people are bothered to vote or can't vote or um, they're disenfranchised, or they go to the polls and there's like a four hour wait, or you know all these other dirty tricks that we're seeing or their race-based gerrymandering. And so Ralph, this is how Ralph Reed described it. He called it the Republican reapportionment advantage. He said, um, if you know Democrats are up one to 3%, we win. If uh, Democrats are up four to, I think it was like 7%, it's a jump ball. And he said, if Democrats are up eight, for eight points or more than they win. So it really shows you how much better um, people who um, vote uh, blue have to do like in order to beat an election. So I don't think, I think people would make a mistake thinking that demographics are gonna solve this problem. There is no substitute for getting out the vote. Um, and, uh, and so how do you really affect change? It's not just changing uh, the person uh, is not just changing uh, presidential, uh, the president. It's all, it's about changing uh, the power in the states, the, you know, the Senate, the House of Representatives, you know, Congress, all that, so that you can get enough uh, agreement on bills to get them passed. So, um, so, so uh, elections matter, but they all matter. It's not just the presidential election that matters. All elections really matter. And even at the local level, it's really important to pay attention who's running in your in your local districts. I would just add, you know, and this is a bit more of a downer that, you know, elections do matter. And I think that makes a big difference. At the same time, this is the what we're seeing now is the result of a decades long movement to affect the courts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the courts are in a in a bad place and they're getting worse, much, much worse, much more favored, favorable towards Christian nationalism over time. And so we're going to have to see some really innovative strategies over the next several years about how we address that and be very careful about how we bring our our cases to sort of reshape the law into something resembling what the founders intended. It's all about bringing the right cases to the right courts. I mean, I've been to a lot of gatherings where they'll say this election is about judges, judges, judges. They get people to vote on the issue of judges, which is really important. Um, I think sometimes, um, uh, when people are voting, they think, oh, do I really like this person? You know, did they say something weird back in 1983? Like, 
for a lot of the right, it's really overlooking a lot of that minutia. It's all about, you know, what judges they're going to put in place um, mm -hmm. because they know a lot of their agendas advanced through the courts. There. But remember, Allison, you know, back when they started this sort of legal strategy of the movement, when the Alliance Defending Freedom was formed, for instance, they were kind of, you know, the, the, the culture was sort of not in their favor, right? Mm -hmm. It was not going in their direction. So they got together, they had a lot of, you know, financial, there was a lot of money that was invested in it, of course, but they really were very um, careful, very about taking the right cases to the right courts, finding the right plaintiffs, mm -hmm. you know, um, and building in a way, not just looking for the big win right away, but putting into place these novel building blocks over yeah. time that they could then use to get the big win. And it's the same way the LGBT movement over time achieved marriage equality, building, putting the building. I mean, that's how you, or in the long run, in the courts achieve victory. But if the courts themselves are stacked in a way that you know you you, you can't win, then you then you can't win. It's tough. But, uh, you know, but there are, even then there are things you can do. Like a new Congress could conceivably double the number of judges on federal benches. That could happen, right? So there are there are things that can be done. Let's see, I'm scrolling through to see if there's any others. There's a bunch. I'm trying to prioritize which ones to ask. Um, so there's a couple ones that, that are along the same theme of aren't religious nationalists declining in numbers? And even though they're more politically powerful, are their numbers dwindling? And is that why we're seeing um, the sort of death throes of their movement? Would you? categorize it in that way where it's it's sort of the last dying gasp of the movement or do you think that it's the opposite and that it's still growing oh i think to get a handle on the numbers we can look at the work of somebody like george barna who was one of the top pollsters of the movement he wrote a book called the day christians changed america and he writes about a group that he calls sage cons it's an acronym that stands for spiritually active governance engaged conservatives. So he said they're disproportionately involved in the political process and they vote in extremely high numbers. According to Barna, they number just 10% of the population, but 91% voted in 2016 um, and 93% of those cast their vote for Trump. So, you know, he puts this core population at about I would say 20 to 25 million. I think perhaps from a political voting perspective, that might be a little bit on the low side. But um, I mean, there's a, you know, other books of by demographers have put the number slightly higher. But what it really shows is that this cohort may be small, but they are um, very eager to see their values reflected in policy and they punch above their political weight because, um, because of their voter engagement, their high level of voter engagement. The religious right is also really good at figuring out um, like how much, like they, they, they figure what slice of the electorate do we need in this particular district? So they'll like really put a lot of resources in turning out the vote in, in those key swing districts. Now, of course, all political parties of all persuasions invest in data uh, in order to turn out the vote and get out the vote efforts. But the key difference with the right is that um, a lot of their get out the vote effort um, operates at the top of a like um, a machine, like a pyramid that's off, off, off um, operating in the faith-based space all of which is exempt from taxes and mm -hmm. uh, and and exempt from public scrutiny sort of uh, because because of uh, the religious uh, nature of the organizations they're working through yeah it's interesting so it sort of facilitates this activity I, I should just mention because I think folks would find this interesting that you know, according to, I think it's Pew's research, agnostics and atheists make up about 9% of the population currently. And our recent research, uh, the US Secular Survey and the Reality Check Report, where we surveyed about 34,000 non-religious people, found a really high rate of voter engagement. It was about 87%. Um, now, that's just a sample. You can't generalize the entire 9%. But um, that's it's not quite as high, but we, I think there's a stereotype around non-religious people, especially you're talking about the so-called nuns, that they're not engaged. Mm -hmm. And I feel like our folks are engaged. And you know, we have the possibility to 
almost equal the numbers and, and counteract a lot of what we're seeing if we can become more so engaged. On the other hand, we don't have the infrastructure currently to make that happen. But I, I think it's interesting to think about it that way. Yeah, so that's actually, it's a, there's a good follow on question to that um, feedback, and it has to do with the Johnson Amendment and the danger of the Johnson Amendment and Trump's um, position of not enforcing it. And is there um, anything we can do at this point to combat that? Or do we have to just sort of wait for changes in the court, changes in the administration? Um, yeah. That's a good question. Um, it's a little bit challenging because Obama didn't enforce it either, right? So, I mean, yes, it's important and we have to maintain it, but it's challenging to enforce. It's politically, I mean, whoever enforces it's going to be attacked by churches and they have to be willing to sort of bear that. Um, and so far, not many presidents have been willing to do that. So, uh, you know, People just work around it if it doesn't have any teeth and it doesn't exist. So, you know, we, we work very hard to maintain it in the law. Uh, and fortunately, through a strong coalition with lots of folks, we've been able, you know, that's been able to be achieved. It has maintained the law, regardless of, you know, what the current president proclaims that he's repealed it. He says that all the time. It's not actually true. It's still in the law. But the question is, how is it, how effective is it? And um, you know, that, that that's an open question about how we could potentially use this in a way where it's supposed to be used, where, you know, political, nonprofit and research, you know, uh, religious groups are not in a, influencing the um, political sphere in a way as they shouldn't. Catherine, did you have anything to add to that? Well, it's interesting. Some, you know, I do, t sometimes I talk to um, progressive religious groups and they ask, you know, they, they often bring up the fact that they do believe in the separation of church and state, and they don't think it's appropriate to uh, politics from the pulpit and to turn um, churches into the shadow cells of a political party uh, of any persuasion. And I completely agree with that. So I think that sometimes people say, well, maybe progressive churches should be doing the same thing, but um, they're not as willing to do that. You know, they want to sort of respect the constitution respect our constitutional principles and and um you know uh, and respect church state separation so. and we as a nonprofit don't want to do it either i mean it sort of paints the entire process right we we want to be able to not we want to be able to be a person not be involved in politics and that's true for you know all the c3 nonprofits so you know it, it's it's a very dangerous idea that this should be that the other side's pushing that this should be eliminated so there's some comments coming in about us not being willing to play dirty in the same way uh, that they are and actually living to our ideals versus um, saying one thing and doing another. So I just thought I'd, there's like a roll of four comments came in right when you guys are speaking. Um, so I, I guess the, the sort of closing question um, is a big one and it's, it's how do we combat this? What do we do next? Um, people are asking, you know, so I joined organizations. Are there other things I can do? Um, what are next steps to, to beat this back? One thing the right, uh, I think, um, has done is they really make everybody feel like voting matters. And uh, voting really does matter. Um, and it's not just voting. I mean, there are a lot of different sort of Organizations like get out the vote efforts people can get involved in. Um, they can invest in, um, you know, whatever their skills are in various sort of data initiatives or messaging um, initiatives or, um, you know, there's just a lot of different organizations out there that are um, that are doing different types of organizing or um, organizations that are trying to make sure like voting actually happens and you know tackle voter fraud. I also often feel like if everyone would just do one little step up from what was done the last time, you know, we, we would we would do pretty well and uh, be able to see some of our constitutional principles restored in our government. I often say that to our volunteers in our groups. I'm like, you know, just pick the one thing, whatever it is that you feel like you can do and do that because otherwise it wouldn't be done. And so just get out there and do the thing, whatever it is. I would say, you know, voting, of course, matters. <clears throat> and also, 
you know, I don't think enough people build relationships with their lawmakers. And it's actually not as hard as it sounds. Like your whoever your your lawmakers at the state and federal level have offices somewhere near you and not in DC or at the state capitol. And you know, if you can become acquainted with them, get to know their staff, basically build a relationship with them so that they know you as a person, uh, that can make a lot of difference, particularly in for for atheists and people that are you know, sometimes there's this idea that we don't exist in their communities, <laughs> that, that somehow atheists all live in New York City or San Francisco or something. But no, we're all over across the country and being visible in that way can be really powerful. So I encourage that. Excellent. So we are getting close to time. We have about five minutes before the end of the program. So I just wanted to give it back to you, Allison and Catherine. Um, you both did a wonderful job and both the, the, the talk that you gave and then the questions back and forth and then also the, the Q&A. But I wanted to see if you had any closing remarks or anything that you wanted to underscore before we wrapped up for the evening. I had one other question, Catherine. You know, Sam talked a little bit about demographics and you know, if you look at Project Bliss, there's a large, percentage of what they're doing that focuses on children. And I, I wonder if this is sort of, I don't know, I want to call it an act of desperation, but is this why the focus is so much on children because they're trying to push back the demographic uh, wheel over time? Is, is that why we're seeing that sort of focus, adding In God We Trust to schools, for example? And if it is, is that effective in any way? Yes, thank you. I mean, in my last book, The Good News Club, was all about the religious right and public education and the focus on children uh, and their earliest years of learning. They know very well that children are very impressionable. They're like little sponges. And they, you know, for instance, if a religious club comes to a public elementary school and there's a chess club happening at the same time that's a school-sponsored activity, if you were to say to the kid, okay, which of these activities is school-sponsored and which is an outside group? They would just like look at you like, what? Like they, they, Anything that's in the public school, for instance, has the stamp of school authority. You know, public schools have a kind of cloak of authority in the minds of little kids, and that's why they're so intent on putting their programs in public schools. So when I was researching that book, um, you know, I actually have this book here that I came across. It's called The 414 Window, Raising Up a New Generation to Transform the World. It was written by a guy named Louis Bush, He's one of the leading mission strategists. He actually, have you ever heard of the 1040 window? It's the area between 10 and 40 north longitude where missionaries are supposed to sort of send their people to evangelize what they call unreached people groups. Do you know, is this language flipping you out? <laughs> like this is the world I, I uh, live in. But anyway, he, he came up with that term and then he came up with this term, the 414 window. It means children between the ages of four and 14. I just want to read you something from this book. It's kind of wild. It says, the, the dynamic inside of the 414 window demands a significant paradigm shift in mythology thinking. Every major movement in history has grasped the need to target the next generation in order to advance its agenda and secure its legacy into the future. Political movements like Nazism and communism train legions of children with the goal of carrying their agenda beyond the lifetime of their founders World religions have done the same. Even the Taliban places great emphasis on recruiting children. And then it ends here. May God inspire you to join us in his battle for the little ones. Mm -hmm. They talk about if you get kids between the ages of four and 14, you get them for life, um, as opposed to concentrating your efforts on adults or older adults. Um, um, you know, we all would be compared, like, con like considered at the so-called repair stage. But they, you know, they call their public schools mission, our public schools mission fields, and they call our children the harvest. And they, you know, say, you know, knock down all doors, all barriers to all public schools and take the gospel to this open mission field. That's how they refer to evangelizing in public schools. They really want to get the kids because they know that if they get the kids, they get the future. Remember Matt Staver, who is a head of Liberty Council, as you know, he said something like, if you want to change the direction of the cruise ship, you've got to reach those kids ages, he said, five to 12. He said, is the most strategic, he called uh, children at that age strategic machinery. He said, is the most strategic age group that we have. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really puts in context. They just passed this crazy bill in Tennessee that uh, authorizes that. one hour a day, children are allowed to leave go, to go to uh, religious services. So it's a release time bill. And um, it's amazing. I mean, with two kids in public schools, I'm wondering like, what hour of the day is that? And how are the teachers going to make it up? And what are the other kids going to learn? Are the teachers then on the hook to like yeah. teach this other, do they stay an extra day or do they just give all the kids time off? And if that happens, you know what's going to happen? The kids who aren't going off to get their religious education, if like enough kids are, are going to have recess. Yep. And the kids going off for church are going to be like, wait a second, I want to stay, I want to stay back and do recess with my friends. Sometimes those initiatives um, don't always play out the way that they're intended. Right, but it has the intent of undermining public education, like you were saying. Absolutely. Saying. And also, um, it's a it, logistical nightmare for teachers and for administrators who are already struggling with, like, you know, how do we, you know, coordinate these classes so you don't have too many kids in the lunchroom at the same time and so that hallways don't get overcrowded. I mean, managing the flow of, 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 of kids in a public school or any school is yeah. it's a job. And if you, read, if you read the literature on these release time groups, they talk about how I've seen stats like 80% of children we bring in this way are unchurched, like as you were saying before. So they think of it as a way to recruit um, non-religious right. young people they can't otherwise reach. So anyway, it's fascinating. And I'm sure Sam wants to end, so we'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> to have another hour conversation on that, probably. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to thank you again for being here and thank you for our audience and all of your great questions. I apologize again that I didn't have a chance to get to all of them. I tried to get to as many as I could or the ones that were asked the most frequently. Um, if there are any that are really fantastic and pressing, I will forward them on to Catherine and see if she's willing to shoot you an email answering your Please, questions. Please, absolutely. I'd and love then, to. Yeah, and then a reminder again that she did offer to sign a book plate for you. So if you want to respond to me by email after that remind the, the follow-up email comes out, then I can make sure that that information gets forwarded on again. And in the chat are links to Catherine's website and to the book on Amazon, and then also to our future talks, which is at atheist.org slash speakers. Um, we have more coming every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Next week, we have Chris Cameron. And then the week after that, we have Mandisa Thomas. And the week after that, we have Jay Wexler. So we are rolling on with this for the foreseeable future till everybody is tired of online events and <laughs> goes back to work and the world is reopened. But we don't know when that will be. So we'll just keep doing that. So keep an eye out. And uh, we have some great programming coming ahead. So thanks again, Allison. Thanks again, Catherine. Thanks, everybody. Thank really you. Yeah, thank you really so good much. feedback rolling in on the Q&A. Excellent talk. <laughs> thank you for being here. Great job. Informative discussions. So lots of, lots of good feedback there. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Good night. You guys.